Tonight, environmental rights activists call for immediate cleanup and remediation of the site of the recent oil spill in Nimbe, Bielsa State. Time to reflect on the condition of the Igbo. Governor Hoku Zodima of Imo State challenges his kinsmen to demonstrate their capacity in a united Nigeria. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar emphasizes the role of education in human capital development as graduating students of Achievers University or War are challenged to show discipline and integrity. And over 70 people killed by tornadoes described as the worst in its kind in the U.S. state of Kentucky. And on business news tonight, Minister of State for Trade and Investment, Miriam Katagum, promises more funding for MSMEs by government. On sports news tonight, former Indomitable Lions captain Samuel Eto has been elected president of Cameroon's Football Association. We begin in Bielsa State, where environmental rights activists in the Niger Delta are calling for the immediate cleanup of the recent oil spill site in Santa Barbara River in Nimbe local government area. The environmentalists made the call during their visit to the spill site to ascertain claims by Iteo Company that the crude oil wellhead has been clamped. They are urging the federal government and the company to immediately begin remediation of the environment and a health audit of the affected persons. A boat trip to the Aiteo oil spill site at Santa Barbara River in Nembe local government area of Bielsa State. The past 38 days of constant high velocity spilling of crude oil is believed to have wrecked enormous damage on the environment. A situation most residents have been waiting to see its end. 300 to 400,000 barrels of oil have been pumped into the ecosystem. And so the first thing to be done is for Etude or whoever to immediately mobilize to clean up the environment. And we call on the federal government to declare a state of environmental emergency across the entire Bayelsa. We think as responsible organizations, we should come and see actually what the state is. If it's been killed, okay, because every step that is taken destroys the environment. So there is no particular um, facility that is created to contain that flushed, dirty water that has sediments. So our waters continue to be polluted. Human and environmental rights activist Ankyo Briggs called for an immediate health audit to be conducted amongst the residents of the state. We really have to begin to insist that uh, our people in these communities are, gone, they are made to go through some, um, some tests, some health tests to see the sort of damage uh, state their lungs um, their, and their liver and their kidney and, um, and things are, are in, even their eyesight. The entire state is now hungry, hungry because we depend on fish and some other produce from this part of the state. And once this segment is polluted, it means that that particular produce you won't have access anymore. Even though the spill has been clamped, clearly the people of this area ought to be catered for as their source of livelihood has been negatively impacted. This is a very big uh, testimony that the land is really, really polluted. We have seen all around the mangroves dead, plants dead. and. There is no life here. I don't think within this environment any fish will be alive. If those creatures on land are dead, the heavily polluted, crude oil polluted water, we cannot have anything alive there. As at the moment of filing this report, no formal statement regarding remediation of the spill site has been issued. 
From environmental to security matters, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Farouk Yahya, is asking commanders of various theaters of operation to prepare for a possible increase in attack by bandits and terrorists in the coming year. According to a post on the Army's Facebook page, Lieutenant General Yahaya made the call while addressing senior officers during the closing ceremony of the Chief of Army Staff Annual Conference 2021 in the nation's capital, Abuja. He challenged the officers to take the fight to the adversary in order to neutralize and defeat them. In his words, Commanders must plan for the possible increase in scope and dimension of the activities of violent non-state actors in the coming year. According to the Army boss, the focus of the Army for the new year would be on developing more capacities for improved performances and ensuring they are equipped with the right skills as well as competencies to confront criminal elements. Meanwhile, bandits continue to wreak havoc in parts of the country with a pastor of the Ekwa Church in Naraya area of Jukun local government area in Kaduna State, Pastor Dauda Baturi, becoming one of the latest victims after he was killed by his abductors. Although police authorities are yet to respond to the development, a top church member told Channel Salvation that the bandits kidnapped Pastor Baturi on November the 8th while he was on his farm not far from the Rigasa train station in the outskirts of Kaduna metropolis. The body of the pastor was later discovered days after his family had paid an unspecified amount of money as ransom to the bandits. However, earlier today, a combined team of security operators repelled an attack by bandits on Sabuntasha GRA. According to the spokesman of the Kaduna State Police Command, Mohamed Jaligi, the bandits, numbering about 30 in military gears and bearing dangerous weapons, attempted to break into the residential area. On receiving the distress call, operators were immediately mobilized with the support of other security agencies and successfully repelled the attack. He said another group of bandits also operated simultaneously at the oil village, also in several location, where they kidnapped a woman and her four children. Still talking security, but this time we move to Imo State, where the traditional ruler of Umbutu Asian Kingdom in Abombise local government area, Damien Waigwe, who was kidnapped from his palace on Thursday morning, has been rescued. The monarch was rescued on Friday and reunited with his family. According to our correspondent, it was not known, as at the time of this report, if any ransom was paid for the monarch's freedom. But a community source had told our correspondent on Friday that the kidnappers had established contact and made a demand of a hundred million naira ransom from his family. From security to other stories now, relief appears to have come for the people of Jamare local government area in Bochi after years of suffering the devastating impact of flood due to unfavorable geographical location. The federal government through the Ecological Fund Office has executed a fund and erosion control project in that community. Now the project inauguration was performed by the Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment. Mrs. Miriam Katangum in the community where she urged the residents to ensure the maintenance of the project. This footage was taken in August 2019. Traders in Jama'ari community in Bochi State were sacked from the markets by flood. Farmlands, houses, property were destroyed and lives were lost. Governor Bala Muhammad was there and assured the people that the federal government would intervene. The topography of the area makes it susceptible to flood and erosion every year. In October 2019, the Federal Executive Council approved the Jama'ari Flood and Erosion Control Project. The project has been completed as the Minister of State, Industry, Trade and Investment inaugurates it. The completion of this project also underscores the federal government's concerted efforts and sincerity of purpose in tackling environmental problems in our country and making life more meaningful for the people of our great nation. The project specifications traverses 11 communities across Jama'ari local government area. Even where we are, 
was a pond. So we had to reclaim this place practically. And that there are sporty areas in Jamara town like this where the experience flood and erosion. So drainages were constructed and culverts in those areas. Like Oliver Twist, the state government urges the federal government to intervene in more communities with similar ecological challenges while stating its complementary rule. In order to provide resources for the control of flood and erosion, our government has made a provision of 500 million naira in the, two, in, the two, in the 2022 budget for this purpose. The people of Jamari are set for a fresh start as they welcome the next rainy season with a smile and hope of improved economic activities. Hajara Ali, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment, Mrs. Miriam Katangu, also represented the president in a Bochi state where she says the federal government's results in investment in infrastructure development are becoming visible as the coming days ushers in completions and, com and commissioning of projects. She mentioned this at the inauguration of Section 3 of the Kano Medugri Road. Motorists now move with ease on the newly dualized section of the Kanu Meidugri Road. The contract, which was awarded since 2006, is now delivered and officially been handed over. The new road, which is Section 3 of the federal government project, is 106 kilometers long and spans Azari in Bauchi State to Potisco Minyobe State, connecting four local government areas. The Minister of State, Industry, Trade and Investment, on behalf of President Mohamed Buhari, officially declares the road open for use. <laughs> Speaking on the project, she assures that the commitment of the federal government towards job creation, ease of doing business, an improved transportation network is evident. The results of our investment are manifesting. I can confidently say that as we enter the final lap of the tenure of the Buhari administration, we're also entering a season of completion and delivery of projects. The presence For the Bauchi State Government and the people, the project is one that brings good tidings to the region. As a major highway, the road will boost mobility, trade and commerce between the northwest and the northeast geopolitical zones of the country. I therefore wish to commend the federal government for this effort. This is what is needed in Nigeria, where governments will come and start a project, and then another government will continue until it is completed. Representative of the Minister of Works and Housing says there's more to come. Indeed, the Sukuk is currently contributing to progress of work on 44 roads across Nigeria. And as we complete them, events like this we hold. The state government says the importance of the road cannot be overemphasized as it will enhance road transportation, security, and open up economic activities to benefiting communities. In part two, after the break, Governor Yeson Wike urges River State residents to hold public officers accountable as he inaugurates the fifth flyover project by his administration. That's in a moment. Join us again. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Environmental right activists call for immediate cleanup and the mediation of the site of recent oil spill in Nimbe, Bayelsa State. Time to reflect on the condition of the Igbos. Governor Hope Uzodima of Imo State challenges his kinsmen to demonstrate their capacity in a united Nigeria. Former Vice President Achiku Abubakar emphasizes role of education in human capital development at graduation ceremony of Achievers University of War, Ondo State. 
and over 70 people killed by tornadoes described as the worst of its kind in the U.S. state of Kentucky. To education matters now, graduating students of Achievers University of War in Ondo State have been challenged to go into the society and demonstrate example in integrity and discipline. The former Vice President Otiku Abubakar, who was one of the eminent personalities honored at the convocation ceremony of the university today, restated the importance of education as key in human capital development. The Vice Chancellor of the institution, Professor Samuel Ajay, listed some of the achievements of the institution. We welcome our Lord Spiritual, Temporal, Physical, Academic. These young men and women are some of the latest graduates in the country, and they file into the Trinity Building for their passing out ceremony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members of the academic community also file into the hall. Rejoicing and appreciating the Almighty God for the 11th convocation. The occasion is the 11th convocation ceremony at the Achievers University in Ondo State, and the hall is fully packed with dignitaries from all walks of life. 434 students in 15 programs are being conferred with first degree awards, with 27 of them bagging first class honors. May I inform this August gathering that our School of Programming students have the following programs accounting, accounting, PhD, uh, from PGG throughout, and we have it also in business administration, political science, computer science, international relations. Criminology and Security Studies, Industrial Chemistry, Biochemistry, Nursing Science. All the teams that so far visited our College of Engineering and Technology have declared that our College of Engineering and Technology as one of the best in the country. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, retired Permanent Secretary at the Lagos State Civil Service Commission, Alaji Olutokumbo Disu Sule, an Emeritus Chief Judge of Oyo State, Honorable Justice Badijoku Adeniji, receive honorary awards. As I said, there is no human development that is better than education. You see, forget about all this oil and gas, forget about solid minerals, forget about all this. If we can only get our education right, we will be on top of the world. There is nothing like education. As customary, the valedictorian gives her speech. Believe in your potential, prove it out with your actions. You know faith without work is dead, so work and pray. I return all glory and honor to all God Almighty who made today reality. Long live Achievers University, long live Ondo State, long live Nigeria. Thank you all. Achievers University, or War, founded in December 2007, is the first private owned university in Ondo State and the institution's management says, providing an enabling environment for production of competent and self-reliant graduates is top priority. From education to infrastructure, Governor Yeson Wike of River State has inaugurated the fifth flyover project to be executed by his administration at the GRA Junction on the ever-busy Aba Road in Port Harcourt, the state capital. Speaking during the commissioning, which was performed by Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mike Ozekume, Governor Wike challenged residents to develop the courage to ask for accountability from public officers. His notable achievements in River State include the provision of road infrastructure and construction of flyovers, and this particular structure, built for commissioning, is one of the signature projects. 
the dual carriage GRA junction flyover crisscrossing Port Harcourt and Obiakpo local government areas is the fifth on the checklist of Governor Yesum Wike and a senior advocate of Nigeria, Mike Ozekome, is his latest guest. Your Excellency, the Governor, has shown that investing in human capacity is the best way to live in the hearts of the people. He has shown that he possesses the capacity. He has shown that it is not enough for a governor to get his monthly allocation from the revenue account under Section 162 of the Constitution. But without showing evidence of what you are using that money for. This even presents an opportunity for Governor Wike to restate his commitment to the terms of his social contract with the people of River State while urging the citizens to be courageous and demand accountability from public officers. Time has passed when politicians will come and make promises to the people and then after the people have voted them in, you have excuses and excuses and excuses. Ours is different. We are not going to give any excuse. And that is why any money that comes, we we'll put it to judicious use for the benefit of our people. And so if I borrow money from bank, and what is important all of us is to ask the people that you have voted, this money you are borrowing, can we see what you have used it for? It's very, very important. The GRA Junction flyover is then commissioned by Chief Mike Ozekome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This new addition will further ease traffic along the ever-busy Aba Road in Port Harcourt. Some artifacts looted from the country during the pre-colonial era are finding their way back home. The latest collections are the bronze bust of an Oba and the cockerel statue which will be received at the Oba's palace on Monday after it was recently handed over to a delegation from Nigeria by Jesus College, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. While the nation awaits the return of these historical objects, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments says it has improved security to keep the prize collection safe and is also confident that the original owner will preserve them. Our correspondent, Jessica Olobusere, takes a glimpse into some of the nation's museums, looking into the challenges they face as well. In a Sierra town, Kwara State, North Central Nigeria, still sitting firmly is the first national museum in Nigeria, established in 1945. There's a fascinating myth regarding the first objects housed here, soapstone images excavated from the area where the museum is now situated. The same people, they were said to be refugees from Odoyo. They were laid down here by a famous hunter, his name is Baragban. So during his hunting expedition, he discovered the object in the premises here, and that's why the museum was, it was sited here. So he went back to inform the then, let's say, so they had to consult the fact, and the fact said that this object we are seeing, they are human being turned into stone, as a sort of their evil intention. The archaeologists, they have to carry out their own research on this object to really ascertain, are they really human beings or not? But at the end of their research, they propound their own hypothesis. We debunk the oral source. Tenaciously standing in Kanu State is the Gidama Kama Museum. The building itself, a national monument said to have been built in the 15th century, houses the Gidama Kama Museum, which has among its collections, in its about one dozen galleries, historic objects from the pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial eras. The youth now, if there's no good publicity, so they don't know even about their culture, they don't know. All what they have been seeing now is these modern buildings, mansion, this thing. That's what is uh, attracting their uh, attention. Not knowing that the old technology, that is uh, the old the ancient buildings that we have, like this type of roofing that you are seeing now, the ancient type of roofing, it was the uh, technology that has been used 
that has uh, now it has been modified to the present technology that we are using. Kaduna National Museum, established in 1975, has among items on display archaeological and ethnographic artifacts. This our exhibition is on knock within the context of terracottas in this in the sub-Saharan Africa. Knock specifically, you know, is a, is an annex we have it in southern Kaduna. Yeah, they are the barbers of knock culture. So it's kind of a archaeological collection. But we have some infusions like Kaduna and its neighbors. There are some ethnographic something from all other countries. But the main one is not within the context of terracottas within sub-Saharan Africa. In Benin City, the Ado State capital, the original home of the Benin Bronzes, a trilogy of timeline for beginnings is what the National Museum here is said to have. 1947, when Oba Kenzwa II is said to have released a royal collection to form a museum of sorts. 1960, when the National Museum was established. And 1973, when this building was set up. The museum has over time held exhibitions and has had progress. It prides itself on how well it has handled its collections. We ensure that the temperature is not uh, too high. We ensure that the relative humidity also is controlled. We ensure also that uh, anywhere we see any, any cracks on our walls through which pests and rodents can come in to come and damage our objects, you know, we control them. We control the lighting also, so they don't damage our objects in the long run. While the curators in these museums believe the facilities have fared well over time, they note some areas for improvement. The museum is catered for everybody in the society, so we experience uh, more patronage and indirectly it will increase uh, revenue. Then it will create employment opportunity. You know, we are even on the start. And the training is not even there any longer. No money because of the economy of the No money. So we need up and doing professionals to be in the field. The funds that come to the federal government, they have dwindled over the years. So MDs are supposed to see what they can do, generate uh, funds to support the programs that we do. That's not saying the federal government still don't support us. They still give us capital budget. They still give us um, uh, overhead, the sense of overhead. But not enough to take care of every, everything. One challenge in the distant past was the issue of security. The Director General of the National Commission for Museums and Monuments explains that staff are trained on ethics in addition to other measures to keep the valuables safe. We have uh, put in place some measures to secure our objects and also to guarantee that all objects that are repatriated to Nigeria, especially the Benin bronzes, will be secured. Patronage is said to have been low. The Commission has a plan to turn that around. We are now looking at improving the museum environment. That is one thing. But that's not enough. Because most of our youth nowadays are so much attached to their telephones and other you know, devices. So therefore, we need to see how we can take them away from that, but that's very difficult. So therefore, we want to use the opportunity of digitizing our objects so that we will now provide digital platforms for them to access and interact and engage with our objects. And by doing that, they, uh, they will be attracted to the museums to come and see the real objects. The Commission emphasizes that even with limited resources, steps are being taken to ensure the continuous training of staff, as well as increased publicity of its exhibitions and activities, as it encourages citizens to stay in touch with their cultural patrimony through the doors the National Museums open into their past. Jessica Olubuse, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, Governor Hope Uzodima of Imo State has asked his kinsmen to reflect on the Igbo question and also demonstrate their capacity in a united Nigeria. That's in a moment. Join us again. Welcome back. We'd like to inform our viewers that there will be a full broadcast of the Achievers University Convocation Ceremony immediately after the news at 10. That's 11 p.m. tonight. So stay tuned for that. 
Another type of call is resonating in Imo State, where Governor Hope Uzodima says it's time to reflect on the Igbo question. The governor is challenging all Igbos not to allow themselves to be cajoled out of the country, but reclaim their rightful place. This, he says, they will achieve by building on their comparative advantage and leveraging their special talents to ensure that the Igbos are accorded their dues in Nigeria. He stated this in Uwere, the Imo State capital, during the official presentation of his book. It's a gathering of academics, top government functionaries, traditional rulers, business moguls, as well as Imo sons and daughters. They are present to witness the official presentation of a historic book, Reflections on the Igbo Question, written by the Governor of Imo State's Hope Uzodimma. Former Chief of Army Staff and Chairman of the occasion, Azubike Ihejirika, commends the author for his courage demonstrated in the book, which highlights issues affecting the Igbo nation within the Nigerian state. In today's Nigeria, there are no lexicons that trigger harsh debate among political leaders across all the geopolitical zones than some of the issues underlined in the book, Reflection on the Igbo Question. The book reviewer Professor Chimanwa Guma of University of Nigeria and Suka draws insights from the 206-page book spanning 10 chapters. His analysis is not restricted to the present-day Nigeria, but includes a historical perspective of the unique challenges that faced and continue to face in Debo over time. Then comes the official unveiling of the book. Spring of Knowledge. <laughs> Governor Uzodima says the book is a reflection of his thoughts on the existential challenges of Indibo in the Nigerian state and provides guidelines on how best to address the issues. My way considered view is that the challenge of our generation of Nigerians is to reinvent a model of democracy that will offer each federating unit a holistic sense of belonging seasoned by equality, justice, and the rule of law. This task is urgent because it seems obvious that the original federal project conceived by our forefathers and secured by them has become weak and should therefore be strengthened to be efficient and functional. Next, the President General of Ohaneze Indibu, Professor George Obiozo, and the former Governor of Imo State, Ikedi Ohakim, emphasized the need for every Indibu to equip themselves with the knowledge the book provides. The idea of violence is not the Igbo character. Combativeness is not the Igbo character. Igbo prefers making friends than enemies. Is it not true? That's why they're everywhere. Where you stand is very solid on the issue of the Igbo question. I want to thank the book reviewer. Our people find it very difficult to read. But you have virtually read the book for all of us. When we get home today, whether we read it or not, we know what is in the book. The book, Reflections on the Igbo Question, gives a thorough insight into five cardinal socioeconomic challenges, perceived marginalization of the Igbo people in Nigeria, restructuring, clamor for secession by Ndibo, the possibility of an Igbo president, as well as the unity of Nigeria. To health matters now, the desire for transformational health care and better service delivery in the country is the motivation for the establishment of the Oludolapo Akikube Pharmacy Education Trust. The foremost industrialist and pioneer in the field has lent his name to the vision. This was the consensus of speakers at the launch of the Education Trust in Lagos. 
It's an assembly of the cream of the pharmaceutical field in Nigeria, including senior citizens like Chief Olu Akikube, who have converged here to honor their maven. The launch of OAPET is timely, coming just days after the foundation lane of the Olu Akikube Faculty of Pharmacy in the University of Medical Sciences, Ondo State, the project for which the trust has been designed to fund. Elder statesmen, including former ministers of Petroleum and Health, Philip Asiodu and Prince Julius Adelusi Adelui, took turns to endorse the Oapet as a worthwhile legacy from the man they describe in glowing terms. I remember in those days when he started farm chemists in Ibadan, there was no place like that elsewhere, not even in Lagos. There was the Nigeria Academy of Pharmacy, and you were one of the first fellows, and you are indeed the only pharmacist who has been given a Life Achievement Award by that academy. The nonagenarian is honored with a medallion by the Nigeria Association of Pharmacists for being the oldest living past president of the association. Chief Akikube spoke on the reason he chose to identify his name with the Pharmacy Education Trust. Everybody knows how much pharmacy has come to the fore as a result of uh, the pandemic. And today's pharmacists would be required to have enhanced skills. Innovation and public-private partnership is the new model for driving tertiary education and OAPET has blazed the trail with this fund. This nod of the initiative was given by the Ondo State Governor, Rutimi Akiredulu, in a message conveyed by his deputy, Lucky Ayedatiwa. It is therefore a most welcome development that a private entity, the Olu Akinkube Pharmacy Education Trust, is partnering our University of Medical Sciences, UNIMED, as a stakeholder and benefactor. There's going to be... Members of the new Olu Akikube Faculty of Pharmacy speak on some of the pillars of the vision. All the medical areas that have been largely neglected would be focused on. So I think it's a fantastic legacy. We'll be to support the building, uh, the equipment, and then endow chairs. So the issue of opportunity for scholarship, I believe, will also come as we go along the way. The OAPET launch rounds off on a high note with the painting of Chief Akikube done by another pharmacist and artist, Francis Gide, in six minutes. At another event in Lagos, over 10 important personalities have been rewarded at the hallmarks of Labour Foundation Awards, recognizing them as role models as well as an attestation that success through genuine hard work is indeed rewarding. The foundation brought together men and women across diverse professions who have contributed immensely to improving the society. Today's event was the 25th in this series. Identifying worthy role models in the country and acknowledging their achievements to inspire young people is the reason behind the hallmarks of Labour Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, now in its 25th year, the foundation, through its role model awards, is acknowledging 11 individuals, mostly from the public service, the Lagos State Government, and three secondary schools for their outstanding results in the senior secondary school examination. The chairman of the occasion, former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Anyoku, set the tone for the event. I would therefore once again like to take this opportunity to urge the powers that be in our country, the powers that be in all the tiers of government, to recognize that our current federal system of government will not lead the country to the achievement of our national aspirations. Great pleasure, very great pleasure. One after the other, awardees step up to the stage to take their awards. 
For outstanding contribution in the field of medicine in 2021, the co-founder of Eco Hospital, Chief Sonny Kuku, takes the plaque. Next is education. Professor Bolanle Awe is awarded for 2020. While Professor Elias Buguru, the Executive Secretary of TED Fund, is the 2021 awardee. So may I say congratulations. Thank you, Your Excellency. The Christopher Kolade Awards in Leadership and Professionalism in Media Excellence is given to 82-year-old Mrs. Stella Marie Awani, while the first Attorney General of Lagos State, 80-year-old Harriet Balogun, is rewarded for her contributions to the legal practice. Then the Minister of Science and Technology, Mr. Obunayaonu, asks for more support for the good work the Foundation is doing. The foundation cannot do it alone. It needs the support and partnership of well-meaning Nigerians and organizations to do it. This award goes to Lagos State Government. Back to the honors. The Lagos State Government is acknowledged for the transparent management of the COVID-19 pandemic. In our country. Congratulations, Your Excellency. The government and the people of Lagos State thank very, very deeply the board and the entire leadership of the Allmark for Labor Foundation. The Lifetime Achievement Award for the country's outstanding international icon is given to the former president of the United Nations General Assembly, Ambassador Mohammed Bandi. This recognition is not just going to be put as something on the table, but something that will inspire us to do better for our country. The event comes to a close with the young achievers giving to three secondary schools for blazing the trail in the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate Examination. Some company news now. The Coca-Cola Foundation, in partnership with Whitefield Foundation, a non-profit enterprise in collaboration with the Kano State Ministry of Youth and Sports, have officially launched Project Equipped in Kano State. The initiative, being championed by the philanthropic arm of the company, is targeted towards empowering 20,000 women and youths with transformative skills and knowledge. <laughs> As part of its vision to enable improved livelihood for women and youths, especially in rural areas, the Coca-Cola Foundation, in partnership with the registered non-profit enterprise, Whitefield Foundation, is in Kano State for the launch of the Equip project. The initiative seeks to ensure the economic empowerment of 20,000 women and youths in Kano, as well as thousands across Lagos, Abuja, Benin Anoweri, totaling 60,000 beneficiaries across states. No nation can grow beyond the level of investment you make in the young people because they are the people who are going to drive this economy in the future. The Kano State Ministry of Youths and Sports is pleased with the scheme. Everybody is welcome to Bologna. Once he's within the age bracket of 18 to 45, and by now we have more than 10,000 people that registered. We have now remaining 9,000 thumbsin, and I'm confident that before the five, the period of five days expire, expiry date, we we'll reach out to everybody so that we can have a target of 20,000, as mentioned clearly. Coca-Cola says it is committed to solving problems by deliberately targeting young people. We recognize Kano's numbers. We know they have a lot of young people, and because over uh, 2020 we had empowered a lot of people around Lagos and the West, we believe that dedicating that number will be quite significant to close the gap for the Northern region. Founder of the Whitefield Foundation gives more insight on the motivation behind the project. The training is going to be in two folds, virtual and physical. The physical training, the people have to register for free at www.whitefieldfoundation.ng 
There are about 60 classes online in employability and entrepreneurial skills. Some registered participants expressed gratitude for the opportunity. This is a very good move, especially here in Kano. The youths, a lot of us, are just at home doing nothing, and it's a very good move. Seriously, I really, we really appreciate it. The Coca-Cola Foundation says the EQUIP initiative is expected to achieve equality and empowerment for women and youths, and in turn impact the society positively. And for the latest on the world of business, let's join Laddie Williams for the details. Use a Minister of State for Trade and Investment, Ambassador Miriam Katagum, is reassuring owners of small and medium businesses of government support towards creating adequate funding to grow their businesses. Speaking at the closing of the Enjoy Nigeria Expo in Abuja, Ambassador Katagum explains that the federal government will continue to offer its hand of support to young enterprises as well as to help them bring their expertise to bear. She says that the intervention by the government is expected to create jobs, encourage export, as well as contribute to the MSME's contribution to the nation's gross domestic product. And forex trading activity at the FMDQ exchange was mostly positive this week as the total turnover of the transactions carried out at the FX spot and futures markets jumped by 31.16% to $1.17 billion as of December the 10th. However, a breakdown of uh, trading results shows that the total value of transactions at the FX spot market rose by 37.54% against the previous week to $972.27 million, while the FX derivatives market turnover inched up by 6.99%. Meanwhile, the Naira fell by 0.09% within the comparative week to 413 Naira 96 Koba against the dollar at the Nigerian autonomous foreign exchange window of the Forex market. And to the equities market now, stocks listed on the Nigerian exchange lost about 150 billion naira mid mixed trading session of losses and gains in the week. The Osha index declined in two trading sessions, down 0.68% in the review week, driven by sell pressure in industrial stocks. Also this week, activity levels were quite positive as trading volumes and value increased by 84.9 and 79.7% each week on week. Similarly, the performances across sectors were broadly positive as all key indexes, except for the industrial index, uh, recorded gains. Mayor PLC topped the gainers chart for this week. Its share price uh, rose by 50%, while Unity Bank PLC uh, was down 15.69%, leading the laggards. The trio of FBN Holdings, Sterling Bank, CNI Leasing uh, PLC led the top trades in the week. Meanwhile, activities at the unlisted securities market closed negative this week as both the NASD OTC security index and market cap decreased. At the same time, NASD investors lost 10 billion naira and market capitalization closed at its 604.88 billion naira in the week. Total volume of securities traded decreased by about 71% to 6.57 million units of shares traded. Central Securities, Clarence System, PLC, and Friesland, Campina Wamco were among the top five traded by volume this week. Also, Central Securities, Clearing System, PLC, occupied the top spot on the Guinness chart. Meanwhile, stocks of Friesland, Campina Wamco, and Nigeria topped the uh, decliners counter for the week. And that's uh, business news. Back to you, Melinda. Victor Matthias has the latest from the world of sports. Indeed, Belinda, welcome to Sports News. Now, former Indomitable Lions captain Samuel Eto has been elected president of the Cameroon Football Federation. Eto defeated rival Seydou Mumbo Njoya in the election and has now secured the mandate to run Cameroonian football for the next four years. Seven candidates should have contested the elections, but five of them pulled out. The 40-year-old has promised a wide range of reforms. And Europe's football governing body UEFA says Tottenham's postponed Europa Conference League game with Rennes will not be rescheduled. 
The group match, which was to be played on Thursday at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, could not take place following 13 coronavirus cases at the club. UEFA, in, co in cooperation with two clubs, tried to find a viable solution in order to reshuttle the match. The result of the match will now be decided by the UEFA Control Ethics and Disciplinary Body next week. And in the English Premier League, Raheem Sterling's 100th league goal was enough to give Manchester City a 1-0 victory over 10-man Wolves at the Etihad Stadium. Elsewhere, Arsenal returned to winning ways with a convincing 3-0 victory over Southampton courtesy of goals from Alexander Lacazette, Martin Odegaard and Gabriel. In a keenly contested match played at Stamford Bridge, Chelsea edged past Leeds United 3-2. A brace for Jorginho from two penalties and a goal from Mason Mount secured victory for the Blues. Liverpool had just one goal to show for their dominance over Aston Villa at Anfield, although Mo Salah's goal from the penalty spot in the 67 minute was enough to secure all three points. And Real Madrid forward Karim Benzema has been declared fit for the derby against Atletico Madrid on Sunday. Manager Carlo Ancelotti confirmed that Benzema, who injured a leg last weekend against Real Sociedad, will play. The derby is already crucial in the race for the La Liga title. Victory would put Real Madrid 13 points ahead of reigning champions Atletico at the top of the standings. And that's it on Sports News. I'm Victor Mathias. It's back to Melinda with the rest of the news at 10. Many thanks, Victor. On the international scene, the governor of the U.S. state of Kentucky says that more than 70 people have been killed by tornadoes overnight. And the Bashir says the figure could rise to as many as 100 in what he describes as the worst tornado in the state's history. He has declared a state of emergency in Kentucky. At least five people have also died at tornadoes wreaked havoc in other states, including one in an Amazon warehouse in Illinois. And the main news again. Environmental rights activists today called for immediate cleanup and remediation of the site of the recent oil spill in Nimbe by Elsa State. They also made a case for some form of compensation for the residents. Also today, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar emphasized the role of education in human capital development at the graduation ceremony of Achievers University or War Undo State. That's the news at 10. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Melinda Akilani.